This episode of Dragnet is brought to you by author T.R. Darling. For the very best microfiction stories on Twitter, please visit and follow at Quiet Pine Trees. That's at Quiet Pine Trees. And now, here's Adam. Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net. You can also send a donation with the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net or become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters at patreon.greatdetectives.net and our mailing address is Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. That's uh, Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. Also, over at greatdetectives.net this weekend, the public domain is expanding in 2019, and I'll be talking about it. You can check out the article, and uh, you can get all of my articles automatically delivered to your Kindle, and you can try that service out free for two weeks. Just search for the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio in the Kindle Store. Now it's time for today's episode of Dragnet. The original air date is March the 9th of 1954, and this one is The Big Cup. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A howling dog causes a man to check his neighbor's house. He finds the brutally beaten body of an elderly woman. She's been killed by person or persons unknown. Your job? Investigate. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 10th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. I was on my way back in from the alley, and it was 7.26 p.m. when I got to 9782 Green Oak Drive. Front door. Did you find anything? No. No sign of anybody out back. Did you call the crime lab? Yeah, I talked to Lee's on the way. That's good. Call Hollywood Division, too. They're going to send out some more men to help us. Well, it's an outside chance. We might come up with something. Yeah. Whoever did it sure must have been wild, Joe. I don't think I ever saw a killing as brutal as this one. It's pretty rough. Must have hit her a couple of dozen times. Look at there. Mm-hmm. See? Wristwatch is broken. Looks like she might have raised her arm to try and stop some of the blows. Yeah. Crystal smashed up pretty bad. It's hard to read. Yeah. Looks like 304, doesn't it? Uh-huh. That must have been the time. From what the neighbor says, that'd have to be this afternoon. Yeah. Did you find anything that looks like the murder weapon? Nothing out in the open. Thought it'd be better if the crime lab checked the place first. How about the other rooms? They as bad as the one out front? Yeah, stuff's all scattered around, drawers pulled out, contents thrown all over. Whoever it was sure wanted us to think it was robbery. Well, let's check the neighbor. Yeah, he's across the street. Said he wanted to go home and take something to help quiet him down. Must have been quite a shock to the old guy. Yeah. You want to tell Brian and Phillips where we'll be? Yeah. Right. Phillips is out in back. I saw him when I came in. I'll talk to Brian. All right. Ask him to let us know when Lee gets here, will you? Yeah. All right. Come on in. Thank you. Mr. Brody? Yeah, over here. Want to turn the lights on? I was just sitting here having a drink, trying to calm down a little. Yes, sir. 
Switch is there on the wall, sort of behind the whatnot. They have to kind of feel around. Yes, sir, I found it. Turned out the lights to help my head. Oh, me, oh, my, I got an awful headache. You don't happen to have a couple of aspirin on you, do you? No, sir, I'm sorry, I don't. Oh, well, I guess I don't mind much. I guess this will do just as good. What if you tell me just what happened here? Well, I'm glad to. Uh, I want to help all I can, sure. I'd like to see you get the guy what did this to Ethel. Well, why do you think it was a man? Huh? Well, you said guy. What makes you think it was a man? Well, I didn't mean it like... You, you know, not special, but uh, come right down to it. Almost got to be a man. You can't imagine a woman doing a thing like that. At least no woman I ever knew. It's got to be a man. Come on in. Everybody come in. Might as well have a convention, all the people coming in. It's my partner, Mr. Brody. Oh, another policeman, huh? Yes, sir. All set, Joe. They're going to call us when the crime lab crew gets here. All right. How are you, Mr. Brody? People all over the place. I never saw a crowd come so fast as when the sirens come in. Seemed like they were attached to mushrooms, just sprung up out of the ground. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Fine, yeah. wonder if you'd mind leaving that alone until we ask you a few questions. Oh, you mean before I have another drink? Yes, sir, if you would. Well, of course. Glad to oblige. I'll wait, I mean. You don't have to worry about me, though. Not old Earl Brody. I can hold my leg. Hey, just bet. Old Earl's a regular tanker. Don't ever show on old Earl. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, if you just tell us about finding the body. Well, I was out in the front watering the lawn. Always do it at the same time, you see. The hot sun burns it up. You don't water, you know. You've got to do that. Yes, sir. Well, that's what I was doing, watering the lawn. Yes, sir. Do you want to go on? You sure you fellas don't want a little snort, huh? Good no, no, no thanks, huh? Rudy. No thanks. Yeah, well, <clears throat> all of a sudden I hear Nero making an awful fuss. Who's that? <laughs> that's a silly name, isn't it? Who is it? Little bitty old peak. She called it Nero. Always seemed to me that if you're going to call a dog Nero, it should be a big dog. Yes, Nero's the dog. Well, what happened then? Well, sir, first off, I didn't pay much attention to it. Just kept right on watering the lawn. And old Nero kept it up. Kept right on yelling and howling. Finally, I figured there must be something wrong. Yes, sir, there must be with all that going on. So I turned off the water and wandered over. You know, check up. Yes, sir. Mr. Brody, about what time was this? I thought it was funny that Ethel not coming out and making Nero shut up. Oh, it was about six o'clock. Yeah, about six mm-hmm. o'clock. Did you see anyone around the house when you went over? Not a soul, no, sir. There's nobody. So I went around back to the patio, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, there wasn't anybody there either. And I knocked at the door. Now, all this time, little old Nero is still raising old Ned. He ain't stopped to breathe hardly. Yes, sir. Well, sir, when I... Knocked on the door, things swung right open. Wasn't locked, you know, so I, I called Ethel. I called a couple of times. I didn't get no answer. I couldn't see nothing, so door opens on a kind of little service porch. I didn't see a thing. Hmm? Yes, sir. Then I went in, walked right into the kitchen. There she was, lying on the floor. Stuff scattered all over, and little Nero sitting right beside her, just going crazy. You called the police right away, didn't you? Well, I run out of the house, all over to my place, and called the operator. I dialed over and told him to send a policeman right away. Yeah, right away I called him. Mm-hmm. Had you seen Miss Lawrence at all today? Yeah, I saw her this noontime. She was out to get the mail, and we said, uh, hello. You know, just as cheerful like, like that. Well, what time did you say hello? Well, I picked up the mail and went right back into the house, just like she didn't have no idea what was going to happen. Oh, about 1.30, mail comes in. Mm-hmm. Did you see anyone around her house this afternoon? Nobody, no, no. Oh, well, of course, now, I, I was out in the back most of the afternoon, you see. You see, out there working in the flowers, so I, I can't right out say that there wasn't anybody over there. I see. Do you know where we can get in touch with Mr. Lawrence? He works in the garage down on Pico. I think I, I got the name of the place around someplace. I used to take my car down to him before him and Mrs. Lawrence got a divorce. How long have they been divorced? About three years, I guess. Well, I'm not really sure about that. How they get along, do you know? Any trouble between them? I guess there's some who'd say that he was right. I made it a practice not to get involved in those things. Religion, politics, and marriage troubles. 
I don't, I don't uh, get meddled up in them. Oh, they, yeah, they fought all the time. Yeah. Has Mr. Lawrence been at his wife's house lately? Well, not that I've seen. I guess they won't oh, see each other, but I, I understand what Ethel said. It was at the lawyer's. She used to try to tell me about it, but I just wouldn't listen. I don't believe in it. Religion, politics, marriage stuff, and all those things, etc., etc. Yes, sir. Alimony. They was always fighting about alimony, always. Do you know what the disagreements were about besides alimony? I'll tell you, mister. You better talk to Mr. Lawrence about that. He's the one to set you right on it. I go telling you, and I'm liable to say something wrong. You see, and that wouldn't be right, I would it? You, you, you better talk to him. You talk to him. All right, sir, if you'll just give us the address, please. Sure, sure. I'll take a look at my checkbook, see if I can find it. You, you talk to him. He don't give you all the scoop, then, then maybe I can help you out a little. All right, Mr. Brudick, thank you. Got any more questions you've got to ask me right now? Well, if you don't feel well, sir, we can talk to you later. Well, ain't that I don't feel good, just that I... Like a little snort, you know, kind of pick me up a little, body and soul together, awful thing, oh, just awful. Well, there may be some more things we'll want to check with you oh, later tonight. A little old snort ain't going to do no harm. One thing, everybody says is old Earl can hold his liquor. Everybody says that. You can ask him, everybody. Mm -hmm. Hard the day goes by, somebody don't say that. Well, if you'll get Mr. Lawrence's address for us, please. Right away, right away, sir. Wonder how you're going to take all this. All them years of battling, screaming at each other. Now they're over. He ain't gonna have no more trouble because of her. No, that's not quite right, sir. Huh? He's liable to have a lot more. Earl Brudig looked through his desk and he found a canceled check bearing the address of the garage where the victim's husband was employed. While he was looking for the check stub, Frank and I interrogated him further on the relations between Ethel Lawrence and her husband. He refused to tell us any more than he had, explaining that if the answers we got from the husband weren't adequate, we could come back and see him. 6.48 p.m. We returned to the victim's house and we talked with Lieutenant Lee Jones. He told us that the crew from the crime lab had been unable to find the murder weapon, but that they had been able to lift several good fingerprints from the kitchen. He went on to say that these had been checked with those of the victim and they were not the same. Little other physical evidence was found in the house. However, an impression of a shoe had been found in the soft earth at the side of the house and a plaster cast had been made of it. We asked Lieutenant Jones to take the fingerprints of the neighbor who'd found the body and check them with the impressions left in the victim's house. 9.46 p.m., the coroner arrived and removed the body and attached the paper seal to the front door. Frank and I went back to the office and checked the name of the victim and her husband through the record bureau. We found that Bernard Lawrence had been arrested four years previously on a wife-beating charge, but that he'd been released when his wife refused to prosecute. We checked the name Earl Broody. He had no record. 10.54 p.m., we drove over to the garage where the victim's husband was employed. The place was closed, but there was a card on the door giving an emergency address. Frank and I drove out to the house, a low, rambling, ranch-style building. The garage owner, Arnold Norton, met us at the door. Yeah? Mr. Norton? That's right. What can I do for you? Police officers. We'd like to talk to you. Yeah, I guess it's okay. I don't know what it's about, but I guess it's okay. What do you want? Might be better if we talked inside. You mind if I see your identification? No, sir. Here's my ID card. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Uh-huh. Yeah, come in. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just a minute, I'll turn off the TV. We don't like to bother you, Mr. Norton. It shouldn't take us too long. Doesn't matter. It's just a fight movie. I've seen it before. I get a kick out of seeing him again. Uh -huh. What is it you want to know? You have an employee named Bernard Lawrence working for you? Yeah, Barney's been with me for about seven years. Why? You have a home address for him? I suppose so. Look, can you tell me what this is all about? Just a routine investigation. We'd like to talk to him. Yeah, I'll write out the address for you. All right. You ever hear about Lawrence and his wife having any quarrels or disagreements? I'm not quite sure how I should answer that. What do you mean? I don't know why you're asking the question. It's a little rough to ask me to comment on the way Barney gets along with his wife. I don't want to lay anything on him. You've known him for quite a while, have you? Yeah, I told you he's been with me for seven years. Best carburetor man I've got. You must have heard him discussing his home life at one time or another, haven't you? Look, I went through the same thing before, you know. I got myself right in the middle before. I don't want it to happen again. I don't understand. When they got the divorce... All the time, lawyers coming around asking questions, trying to get me to take sides. I'm not going to do it. If Barney's trying to bring the thing up again, he should be the one to tell me, not have you fellas come around and do it. I'm not going to get in the middle again. I've known both of them for a long time. I think a lot of them. Ethel and Barney and me have been pretty close in the years. But I've had it. All the questions about how much Barney makes, what were his working hours, who did he see, did he run around with any girls? No. I'm not going to answer any more questions. Well, this isn't a civil matter, Mr. Norton. This has nothing to do with the divorce? No, sir. 
I'm not going to be called as a witness? We can't say to that, sir. Uh-huh. The way you fellas are going about this routine thing makes me think that it's a lot more important than just a traffic ticket or anything like that. Well, it is. Did you see Lawrence today? You mean at the garage? Yes, sir. Yeah, he came to work at 8, just like he always does. He was there all day? 8 to 5, that's what he works. Does he have occasion to leave the garage at all during the day? I don't understand what you mean. Well, does he have to leave to go pick up parts, anything like that? Yeah, once in a while he does. We got a fellow who does that kind of thing, but when he's out on the call and Barney needs something fast, he maybe runs down the street and gets it. Mm -hmm. Did he leave the garage this afternoon? Yeah, he had to go down and pick up some rebuilds. Do you know what time he left? It'd be hard to pin it down to an exact time. I, I don't much keep tabs on Barney. He comes and goes as he pleases. Pretty important that we get an idea of when he was gone. Well, I can check it with the other boys in the shop. I should be able to find out when he left. I know he got back about 4.30, though. You're pretty sure about the time? Yeah, he came back and did a job on a rush one that we had, and then he took off at 5. How was he acting when he came back? What do you mean? Did he seem upset about anything? No, not particularly. He seemed pretty happy, though. Kept talking about what a beautiful day it was and how good he felt. Uh -huh. You know, come right down to it, Barney was happier than he's been in some time. Just seemed like all his troubles were gone. Well, we know how you feel about this, Mr. Norton, but it's pretty important. Did you ever hear Mr. Lawrence threaten his wife? I'm going to have to take your word for it being pretty important, Mr. Friday. I've got no way of knowing, but if you guys get me in the middle of anything, I'm going to be pretty sore about it. Well, don't worry about that. Well, then to answer your question, Barney and Ethel didn't get along very well. I guess you knew that. Divorce and all, Ethel accusing Barney of running around, they had some pretty big arguments. Mm -hmm. Barney was pretty mad at the judgment he got, the alimony. He had to pay Ethel 150 a month. Made him pretty sore. But the judge said to pay it or go to jail. Ethel would just as soon see him in jail. Mm -hmm. Barney used to talk to me about it. We'd stop down the street and have a beer when we closed up the shop. Barney would say there was only two ways he could get out of the alimony payments. Well? One was if Ethel got married again, and Barney always said she was so mean that no sane man would have her. What about the other way? That was for her to die. Mm -hmm. I guess that was about the only threat he ever made so I could hear it. What's that? That he wouldn't mind helping her out. Eleven forty-seven p.m. We drove over to the address we'd gotten for Bernard Lawrence. It was a modern apartment building in the Wilshire district. We rang the bell to his apartment, but we got no answer. Frank and I talked to the manager of the building, and he let us into the suspect's apartment. In a preliminary search of the place, we found nothing to tie the man in with his wife's death. However, from the clothes and the other personal effects in the place, we were reasonably sure that he'd returned to the apartment. The manager told us that Lawrence had come home after work, changed his clothes, and left, saying that he'd return later. We put in a call to the office and we told them where we were and we made arrangements to be relieved the next morning in the event the suspect hadn't returned. Frank and I settled down in our car, which was parked across the street from the apartment, to wait for Lawrence. At 1.30, Frank went down to the corner and called Faye to tell her he'd be a little late. He brought back a carton of hot coffee and some sandwiches. The stakeout continued. 2.30, still no sign of the suspect. 3.30, 4. At 5.30 a.m., the landlord came to the porch of the apartment house and yelled at us, indicating he wanted to tell us something. Frank went over to see him while I waited in the car. A couple of minutes later, Frank came running back. Joe? Joe? Yeah. Manager just got a call from Lawrence. What about? Lawrence wanted to have his stuff packed and sent down to the depot. Yeah? Said he's leaving town. You are listening to Dragnet the authentic story of your police force in action. Five forty-two a.m. We called the business office and had arrangements made to check the reservation lists on trains going east. We also set up stakeouts on the depots and on the airline terminals in the event the suspect changed his mind about taking the train. Two officers came out and relieved us at the apartment. The manager of the apartment was instructed to notify the officers on stakeout in the event he heard from Lawrence. 6.12 a.m., Frank and I drove back downtown. We went to the business office and got out a local and an APB on the suspect. We checked out of the office to go home and change our clothes, and at 8.46 a.m., we met back in the squad room. Well, you made it fast, huh, Joe? Yeah, carton of coffee there if you want some. No, thanks. I've got something to eat on the way in. No. Any word? No, not yet. Lawrence still hasn't showed up at the apartment. There's nothing from the depot stakeouts. Oh, man, I'd sure like to get some sleep. Well, I'm with you there. You know, Faye sure is sore. What about last night? Yeah, had it all planned that we were going to a movie tonight. Always plans it on my day off. Well, You know, we have dinner and go down to the neighborhood. Kind of nice. She looks forward to it. Well, what's that got to do with last night? Well, this is my day off, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it says on the schedule. And I'm working, right? Yeah. Well, I worked all last night, too. Huh? Yeah. 
Gonna be no movie tonight. I don't follow you. Well, I'm gonna sleep. As soon as I get home, I'm gonna climb right into the shower, dry off, into bed. Gonna sleep the clock around. Yeah. That's why. Mm-hmm. We gotta talk to Skipper this morning. Is he in yet? Yeah, he's down at Chief Brown's office. Mm-hmm. You fill him in? Yeah, a little bit. He goes along with us. Mm-hmm. Well, let's check R and I. I want to look at that arrest report on Lawrence, see if any of his friends are listed. We might be able to get a lead on him. Better find out if he made that call he was supposed to have made when he was gone from work, huh? Yeah. The way it looks, he's still in town. Well, that doesn't do us a lot of good unless we know where. Well, we can go out and talk to the fellow that found the body. He might be able to come up with something. Yeah, better put a stake out on the garage where Lawrence worked, too. He might show up there. Right. I'll get Norton on the phone. Tell him to let us know if he hears anything. Yeah. Right. You know, the whole thing looks pretty clean. All we got to do is put Lawrence at his wife's house this afternoon. We got it made. Yeah, there's only one trouble. Yeah. We got to find him before we can put him there. <laughs> After putting in the call to the garage where the suspect was employed and arranging for a stakeout on the place, Frank and I checked the arrest record that had been made out four years previously and obtained a list of his friends and relatives. We contacted each one of them, but they could give us no information on Lawrence. That morning, we met with Captain Lorman, and we went over the evidence with him. The fingerprints found at the scene of the murder had been eliminated when they were compared with those of the neighbor, Earl Brudig. Other physical evidence netted us nothing. The murder weapon still had not been found. The only piece of evidence that we had to attempt to identify the killer was the plaster cast of the footprint found by the side of the house. However, Lee Jones said that it would be of little use other than to identify the size of the shoe. It was a size 10 with a leather sole and a leather heel. There were no distinguishing marks on the impression. Two days went by and we still hadn't found Lawrence. We talked to the men he worked with, but none of them could supply us with any information as to his possible whereabouts. We checked the bars he was known to frequent without results. Apparently, the suspect had disappeared without a trace. On Saturday, June 14th, three days after the murder, Frank and I got back to the office after lunch. You want to check the book? Yeah. Where can I find Joe Friday? I'm him. I'm Barney Lawrence. Well, we've been looking for you. I want you to get off my back. Leave me alone. Do you mind telling us where you've been for the past three days? It's none of your business. The only reason I'm here now is I want to tell you to stop going around asking a lot of questions, causing me embarrassment. What do you mean by that? You know what I mean. I don't mind telling you I'm pretty sore about the things you've said behind my back. You probably didn't think I'd find out about him, but I did, and I'm telling you to stop. You ought to take it easy, Lawrence. You keep your nose out of this, cop. I'm talking to him. I got a few things for you, too, before I leave. Yeah? I don't think you're going to leave. What's that supposed to mean? Just what it sounded like. You're under arrest. For what? Suspicion of murder. You figured I killed Ethel? You look good for it. Then you better get a pair of glasses, cop. I'm walking out of here, and if you're smart, you won't try to stop me. I wouldn't try it, Lawrence. Lawrence? Now, hold it. If you haven't done anything wrong, you got nothing to worry about. Now, come on back here. You know something? What's that? I've always wanted to hit a cop. Come on, Lawrence. On your feet. Keep your hands off me, cop. Just keep your hands off me. All right, now sit down. Right here. Sit down. Go ahead. We're investigating a murder. Someone beat your wife to death. We're trying to find who did it. Well, it wasn't me. You got a funny way of showing it. The suspect was booked in at the main jail on suspicion of murder. Lawrence put in a call to his lawyer, and arrangements were made to have him released on bond. Frank and I attempted to interrogate him before he was booked, but he refused to answer any questions we put to him. The following morning, we met with he and his lawyer. Again, we ran into the same stubborn silence. At 11.30 a.m., we met with Captain Lorman and Chief of Detective Thad Brown. We laid out the evidence we had. From all appearances, we had the guilty man in custody, but it might be difficult to prove in a court of law. The one thing we'd been unable to establish was Lawrence's presence in the house at the time of the murder. It was decided that without being able to prove this, we would have little chance of getting a complaint from the district attorney's office. Frank and I started re-questioning the neighbors. None of them could tell us any more than they already had. We re-questioned the man who'd found the body, Earl Brudig. He came up with the additional information that there had been a crew of carpenters working on a house the day of the killing. The building was located next door to him, directly across the street from the place where the murder had been committed. We questioned the carpenters. None of them could tell us anything. However, there was one man who had been working on the construction that we were unable to reach. It took us several days before we were able to find him. On Wednesday, June 18th, we got to his house at 7.30 a.m., just before he left for work. He asked us to talk to him in the kitchen of his home. I'm just having breakfast. Fix you guys something to eat? No, thanks, Mr. Hewitt. We don't want to take up much of your time here. Oh, don't worry about that. What's this about, anyway? Well, we understand that you were working on a job on Green Oak Drive on the 10th of June. Is that right? Let me think. Yeah, yeah, 9700 block. Yeah, I was there. Why? You worked there all day, did you? That's right. Left the place around, uh, 5.30. Say this about that woman that was murdered? Yes, sir. You got the fellow did it? 
Well, we think we know where he is. You guys like a cup of coffee? Yeah, fine. We'll join you. Yeah, thanks. Either of you use sugar? No, no thanks. No thanks, sir. Don't see how you can drink coffee without it. Always use two spoons myself. That's good. Well, say, if you know who did the killing, how come he isn't in jail? We need a little more evidence before we can take him to court. That's why you're talking to me, huh? That's right. A couple things you might be able to straighten us out on. Why me? Well, we've talked to the other men in the crew. Seems like you're the only one left. Comes right back to me, huh? That's right. Yeah. What's the matter, Hewitt? Got to sit down. What's wrong, Hewitt? What's the matter? You sick? Poison. Poison in the sugar. I've been expecting it. Frank, get an ambulance. Quick. Yeah. What kind of poison, Hewitt? What kind? There's nothing you can do now. I know this is wrong, taking poison. I killed the old lady. I killed her. Ambulance on the way, Joe. No hurry. He's dead. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 23rd, an inquest was held in offices of the coroner in and for the county of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that inquest. <laughs> At the inquest, it was ruled that the suspect, Merle Patrick Hewitt, died of self-administered poison and his death was listed as a suicide. The victim's husband, Bernard Jerome Lawrence, was released from custody. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank the editors of Time Magazine for their cover story of Jack Webb and Dragnet. That's Time Magazine, on your newsstands this Thursday. <laughs> You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Rocky Fortune following John Cameron Swayze and the news on the NBC Radio Network. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series. Oh, and a madam's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Wow, I had forgotten about that ending. Uh, and this is why it's a good thing to re-listen to a series like Dragnet where you have uh, 300 episodes out there. Because I don't think anybody can hold the details of all of these programs in their heads. I, at least I can't. You know, I've got my uh, favorites, but there are a lot of uh, very interesting episodes that are outside that. And this one is just a, a stunning ending. And it's probably only uh, an ending that a show like Dragnet could uh, get away with. You know, if you had uh, Boston Blackie 
And uh, throughout the case, you know, it's really looking like the husband, and then it just turns out to be some uh, random uh, workman who was working across the street, and he kills himself at the end of the episode. I don't think you could get away with it. But with Dragnet, you can get away with these, you know, out there endings because it's based on a real life uh, story. And uh, it is that saying of truth being stranger than fiction. You could never get away with this in something that was pure fiction. But here it's just one of those things that uh, has happened to a police officer at one point where uh, they thought they knew who'd done it. And then at the last minute, a guy that they were just wanting to question uh, admits to the crime and commits suicide, and they don't even find out why he did it. Such is the lot of the real-life working detective. All right, well, that will do it for uh, today. Join us back here on Monday for Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. And we'll be back here next Saturday with another episode of Dragnet. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.